Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Makover. I'm a lawyer and I'm, a, I'm the chair of uh, Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights. You may be aware that, uh, and if you're not, then I'm telling you now that we have put a, a detailed document of our international law analysis of the circumstances of the uh, Israel's actions on our website, and you can download on the Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights website a full document. I'm not going to read a full legal analysis now because uh, uh, I don't think that's this is the right moment or the right time. Sorry, what was that website? It's uh, it just if you put in a search Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights, you'll find it. Uh, www.lphr.org.uk, I think it will be. Um, I want to say also when, when we prepared that document, we consulted with very uh, eminent international maritime law experts. So we've drawn on expertise of people who really do know this area of law extremely well. I want to caution you, I'm not an expert in international maritime law, but I've gathered together information which I believe is authoritative about the law. And I can also speak in a, from a point of authority about international criminal law as um, I was one of the legal team, uh, you may be aware, that obtained the arrest warrant for Doran Almog, the Israeli general who, uh, who landed at Heathrow in September 2005. So I just want to say very briefly and in summary that Israel's interdiction of the flotilla ships in international waters is illegal. And I think it's absolutely clear that the interdiction was illegal for one or more of the following reasons. The principle of what's called exclusive flag jurisdiction. So if, as we understand it, that uh, the boat, the main boat that was inter interdicted, was a Turkish flag vessel, the exclusive flag jurisdiction is that of Turkey. And such a ship uh, cannot be interdicted in international waters, except in very exceptional and narrow circumstances. Um, under the London Declaration concerning the laws of naval war of 1909, an interdiction is prohibited unless a ship has actually breached a blockade. And the blockade itself has to be lawful and lawfully enforced. And we would say that even if it was possible to conceptualize the blockade of Gaza as lawful, the fact that a quarter of the necessary foodstuffs and medical uh, supplies, according to UN authoritative figures, gets through into Gaza, in itself makes the blockade unlawful. So there is a line of argument by which you may say Israel can during a period of wartime or conflict, impose a blockade. But that blockade has to have, abide by certain very clear principles and rules. The Israelis have broken those very principles and rules. So even if we go down the track of beginning to think about a blockade being lawful, Israel has faltered at a hurdle, a key hurdle, by not allowing enough aid to get through. Um, also, there's a convention, which is the IMO Convention on the Suppression of Unlawful Acts against the safety of maritime navigation of 1988, Israel is a party to that treaty, as is Turkey, that criminalizes the seizure of ships on the high seas and also says that if you kill or injure someone during an unlawful seizure, uh, that that is a criminal offense. So, for all those reasons, uh, the activities on Monday, 31st of May, by the Israeli armed forces were unlawful. It follows as it must do, logically, that when an unlawful act is perpetrated on a group of people, they have a right, under any legal system, to defend themselves. And we don't know yet, and Sarah didn't see vital bits of the chain of events, who used force first. In any event, even if it was not the Israelis that used force first, they were like the burglar entering your home. And there's been famous case law in this country about what's a proportionate use of force. You can certainly use force lawfully to get rid of a burglar that's entered your home. That's exactly what the, the nationals who were standing on that boat had a right to do, a perfect right to do. Fend off these people who were unlawfully on their, uh, their territory. They had a right to do that. The extent to which they could go in doing so is determined by Turkish law. This was a Turkish vessel. I'm not an expert in Turkish domestic law. But I can tell you, as a matter of fact, they had a right to try and get those people off their territory, as you would do a burglar in your home. Now, what we've ended up doing is the burglar has killed the civilians inside the property, not the other way around. And we've had some famous cases in this country. So the burglar, being attacked, doesn't leave your home. He says, no, I'm not leaving your home. I'm going to assert my will and starts killing the people in the house. That's what's happened here. 
uh, in my view, as a legal, legal analysis, is pretty straightforward. The burglar has committed murder and needs to be brought to book. And the first thing that needs to happen is all the evidence related to those events needs to be handed over from Israel. It's not safe in Israel's hands. There's a clear track record of Israel failing to abide by the rule of law. And it needs to be handed over. And then we can see to what body and in what way we can actually achieve justice for these victims of these terrible crimes that occurred on the 31st of May. I think that's enough. I see all the press have gone, because obviously lawyers are much less interested than real people. Um, but if you want to ask me any questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan Polden from counterfire.org. What mechanisms should be actually put in place, international criminal court, things like this, what can actually be done and what should people be pressuring their governments to do as well? Well, that's, I think the, the problem is that as I've analysed it and explained it to you, it's really in the hands of Turkey. If that was a Turkish uh, flag vessel, it's a matter for Turkey. Turkey needs to decide, is it going to assert its own national jurisdiction and say, please hand over all the evidence to us immediately. We are now going to take this matter as a criminal investigation under the Turkish legal system. And in my view, they'd be perfectly entitled to do that and call for international support. And everyone should back them, if necessary, through a UN Security Council resolution requiring Israel to comply with it. I know that the UN Human Rights Commission has already set out a UN fact-finding mission. That's a different issue. A fact-finding mission is not a criminal investigation per se. So it's the Turkish authorities that need to make a decision about what they want to do and what support they seek from others to do it. And I can't speak for Turkey, but I can tell you what their rights are as a, as a lawyer analysing this clearly. And they have a perfect right to insist on their jurisdiction being paramount. And what worries me is that every hour that goes by, like any criminal case, you're dependent on the quality of the evidence. The quality of evidence has degraded massively the moment that Israel took all the evidence into its hands. It's grabbed everyone's phones, cameras, uh, anything they may have written down contemporaneously, it's all gone into a black hole. And what we need to do is we need to tell Israel you cannot get away with dropping everything into a black hole and thinking this is all going to go away. That takes the world community to stand up and say the rule of law must apply to Israel like every other state on earth. And Israel, and maybe a couple of other states, thinks that the rule of law doesn't apply to them. Yeah. Uh, Sarah just said that she signed a document to confess that uh, she entered Israel illegally. What is the power of this document uh, in the law? And the second question is, uh, um, uh, is what happened uh, could be considered as a war crime yeah. in international jurisdiction in the UK? Okay. Um, as to the signing of documents, clearly if someone signed a document under duress, it's invalid. The question is, the factual question is, was, were they under duress? Uh, so I think we need to see those documents, we need to understand the precise circumstances in which people signed pieces of paper, and then we can give better advice. Now, the question of a war crime is very interesting, uh, because, of course, we, we are in an unending armed conflict, in a way. Um, it's possible, in my view, that certainly the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction, but it's a matter for Turkey, because it occurred on a Turkish vessel. We're in a different position than normal. Uh, the Palestinian Authority purported to invoke the, the Rome Statute by going to see the Chief Prosecutor in January 2009 and giving them a letter saying the State of Palestine wants uh, the, there to be a, a criminal investigation. We recognise the authority of the court. Now, Turkey has also not signed the statute, but Turkey clearly is a state and could say, we, in relation to these events, hand over to the International Criminal Court the jurisdiction to deal with it. So, in my view, there is an argument to say this is an international crime that does fall under the International Criminal Court, but the, the first first party in all of this is Turkey, and they have to make the first decision. Well, so, my question is about UK. Well, that, that is a more moot point. I don't. I, I think it's possible, and it needs to be investigated further. It's a, it's a grey area. What protection do journalists have in a situation like this to transmit the information that they have? Their cameras, their equipment. Uh, there was an. Yeah, Israel has ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, like the European Convention on Human Rights Act contains a whole series of rights, including the right to freedom of expression, the right to, re to record and transmit uh, evidence. They've been, those rights have been breached. So individual journalists have their human rights breached. Those human rights are not, uh, don't disappear in a time of conflict. They may be uh, modified or further truncated, but they don't go entirely. So I would say they have their human rights uh, infringed. Unfortunately, Israel has not ratified something called the Additional Protocol, though there's no practical re legal remedy for journalists. 
uh, unless they're able to find some kind of civil remedy that the Turkish authorities standing in the front line want to pursue. Yes? Yeah, it's, it's shocking. I mean, the idea that the burglars take charge of the investigation of the killings of those that they've left lying strewn about the house. I mean, nobody in their right mind applying law or the rule of law and basic rules of common sense to this situation would have come out with a solution, which is we stand back and allow Israel to hold on to all of this. I think Doug, one more question. I think at that point, end. We've seen in a lot of other cases where the law as a remedy just doesn't work. Yes. Are we holding out logic? Well, I hold out hope because the law is there and the remedies exist, and it's, a, it's about time the remedies were, were delivered to the victims. But a lot of this does lie in Turkey's hands right now. And so I think you need to address your questions to the Turkish authorities because they have a lot of thinking and a lot of actions that, they're in, that lie genuinely in their hands. So they hold all the cards legally right now. And I think the key issue in the next days and weeks is what Turkey wants to do with that, that very strong deck of cards that it's you know, holding in its hand. Certainly has a, a lot that it could do, and it's a question of what it wants to do. And that, that you address to them, not me, I'm afraid. I think, I think I'd like to end it there, and, and we'll find out what's going on with the other interviews. Many thanks. Uh, just Thank to you. let people know.